Hello and welcome! I'm three bots in a trench coat and I just made second place in Saturday's Modern Challenge with green, white, hardened scales. So I'm just going to go over the list and the replays and I hope you guys enjoy. I've been playing this deck for almost a month now. Uh, I kind of switch around. I like to just play one deck at a time because I don't really have time to play the whole format. I'd rather just be good at one deck. And I gotta say, this deck is incredibly fun, really challenging to play, and to play against, and uh, really powerful. In fact, most of all, I think this deck is just underplayed, uh, probably because it's so hard to get into. You know, there's a lot of complicated lines you've got to learn. But um, hope hopefully, uh, with my second place finish this weekend, uh, maybe there will be a little uptick in hardened scales players. So if you know the deck, you know that these 22 cards are the core. Those are non-optional, and you need at least 24 lands. So the only real flex slots are these 14, and I opted for a package of four Welding Jar, four Ancient Stirrings, four Esper Sentinel, and two Arcbound Worker, with only two Ozolith in the main deck. Uh, I saw a list that was pretty similar on MTG Goldfish, but I said I really like how streamlined this uh, this package seems to me. It just uh, it just all kind of works together, right? So um, I love Ancient Stirrings. Um, Ancient Stirrings it does raise your curve a bit, but the power level of Urza Saga and Arcbound Ravager specifically is so much higher than the rest of your deck that I think there's really no excuse to be playing some number of some amount of card selection to help you find those powerful spells sooner. And then Esper Sentinel is uh, kind of a new card in this uh, that people have been trying out. It's not very synergistic. It's not like Arc Arcbound Worker where it really works with your plan A, but it's just so good in the grindy matchups, uh, which are some of our toughest matchups. So I think you really want those just to hedge against the uh the more controlling decks um the problem with playing four ancient stirrings and four esper sentinel is um mostly in the mana base because uh you don't get to you don't get to play as many utility lands um if you need white mana and green mana on turn one which is why i'm playing for spire of industry and Spire of Industry works really well with the Welding Jar. And Esper Sentinel also works really well with the Welding Jar, because you want to get an Esper Sentinel down on turn one and protect it. And Welding Jar also lowers the curve to help offset the uh, downside of Ancient Stirrings, which is that you're spending a whole mana to not really do anything when you play it. So I think these uh, four four ofs in particular just make sense together to me. Um, which is why I've been playing this list recently, and uh, it seems to have paid off. Um, the only utility land I'm playing is Pendlehaven, which is obviously a untapped turn one green source for Ancient Stirrings. I think if you're playing four Ancient Stirrings and four Hardened Scales in the main, you really do want 14 untapped green sources. Um, but a lot of lists will play a utility land like Power Depot, or um, Lanawar, Reborn, and those are really good cards. But I think um, I think with this list in general, trying to keep the curve as low as possible, I decided to go with just 24 lands and very limited utility lands. Besides, obviously, Inkmoth Nexus and Urza Saga, which are non-optional. Those are also some of the most powerful cards in the deck. Uh, and somebody commented on the one Battlefield Forge. Um, you really do want to maximize red mana. I mean, after uh, your utility lands and your colored mana sources, the next thing you want to consider is how much red mana you have access to so that you can turn Zabaz into a sack outlet because this deck really needs more than four sack outlets, I think. You want at least, like, six sack outlets in the main to function. Maybe you play a Witch's Oven, which you can tutor up with Urza's Saga. But if you don't have any sack outlets other than Arcbound Ravager, you have to really place a premium on red mana, which will allow you to count Zabaz as a sack outlet 
when uh, when you need one, which is why I'm playing four Spire of Industry and four or and one Battlefield Forage. And then if we take a look at the sideboard, I actually have basically no cards for the controlling matchups like um, like Blue White or Grixis Shadow, besides the one of Pithing Needle, which is useful in a in a ton of different matchups. Um, and I made this decision because the deck is basically pre-boarded for these matchups with the four Esper Sentinels in the main. I really don't want to be cutting Ancient Stirrings, Esper Sentinel, or Welding Jar in these grindy matchups because one of the main ways that you win against Grixis Shadow is with turn one Esper Sentinel into Welding Jar, making it difficult for them to remove and difficult for them to play spells without uh, falling behind on card advantage. And this opens up more sideboard slots for some of the uh, fun ofs that you sometimes see in the main deck, like Shadow Spear, and then a Graph Digger's Cage, which um, you don't bring in very often, but when you do, it's just so nice to be able to tutor for it with Urza Saga. And also seven uh, ways to remove permanence. Most lists play six in the board, and uh, I really like having the seventh, the extra pad to exile against Reanimator and Hammer Time specifically. Hammer Time doesn't feel like it should be a bad matchup, but in my experience, it's actually my worst matchup. I've played against it 15 times. It's the number one deck that I've played against on MTGO. And uh, it's, I think, the worst matchup of any of them, except for more obscure decks it's definitely the my worst matchup uh of any of the decks that you really expect to see in a big tournament so i really like having that one extra removal spell so let's go over the replays i'm just going to do this all in one take but if you like what you see um and this video gets 100 likes maybe i'll do some live gameplay with commentary probably just going to post it to YouTube. I don't like streaming because uh, then I feel an obligation to entertain people, and that's like way too much pressure. Distracts from the magic, you know? And we're really here for the magic. So, this is the Saturday, uh, January 29th Modern Challenge, Match 1, Game 1. Um, my opponent wins the roll. They're a Luris deck. They start off... Ooh, this is auto-playing, isn't it? Um, they start off with a Ragavan, so that probably means they're on Grixis Shadow. Oh, and also, I said I was going to do this all in one take, but uh, I'm not, I haven't even looked at the replays since I played them. So if I miss something, be sure to let me know in the comments. Um, if you want me to explain something, just uh, give me a timestamp. And if you think I made a misplay, just suggest an alternate line. I'm always happy to see feedback. I definitely didn't play this tournament perfectly. I mean, it was uh, 11 rounds of magic. I played for nine hours, so I'm bound to make mistakes at some point. I'm not a robot, although I'm actually three bots. Um, wow, missed opportunity for a joke there. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm always looking for ways to improve. And like I said, this deck is so hard to play. There's, it's a really long learning, learning curve. There are so many opportunities to improve and so many opportunities to mess up. So I didn't even go over my opening hand here, but this seems like a really solid opening hand. Uh, you really want to be looking for Urza Saga, Arcbound Ravager, and the Ozolith. Those three cards and Ancient Stirrings. No, not Ancient Stirrings, um, Hardened Scales. Those four cards are, I think, the cards that can really, that really make or break most of your opening hands. So to see three of them in the opener is an easy keep. And I played the Welding Jar before the Ozolith to protect it from removal. But I am going to get hit by Ragavan here. Oh, does this step one step at a time here we go this is one turn at a time so opponent actually hits our hangerback walker 
off of Ragavan and decides to play it. And then they play an Urza Saga. So this is not Grixis Shadow. It is, in fact, Jund Saga, which is a matchup that we'll be seeing again this tournament. Uh, this turn, I draw Esper Sentinel, which I do not have the mana to cast. Um, but I might be able to find the mana off of Ancient Stirrings. I get my Urza Saga down and play my own Hanger Backwalker, so it's kind of looking like a mirror on the board so far. Opponent Thought seizes my Walking Ballista and plays a Pyrite Spell Bomb. Um, Pyrite Spell Bomb, threatening to kill whatever I play here. I'm going to have to play around that. And I decide to play the, ooh, wow. So going one turn at a time is too fast, but going one step at a time is too slow. Replays are hard. But anyway, I do find a white source off of the Ancient Stirrings and land an Esper Sentinel. And then I have mana up to activate Hangerback Walker if I need to. Whereas my opponent activates, activates their Hangerback at their end of turn. And they decided to Thought Seize my Walking Ballista here. Which is interesting, um, I would have thought they'd taken the Arcbound Ravager, because Arcbound Ravager is probably a better card in this situation. I mean, it's just so hard to deal with once it lands, but maybe they're counting on having a removal spell for it. So I might want to play around their removal spell in hand, because Jun Saga does play a lot of removal. Alright, let's try stepping through a few steps at a time. Alright, so they decide to get Shadow Spear with their Urza Saga. That's one thing that's always... Excuse me. That's one thing that's always uh, amused me about Jun Saga is that, like, Urza Saga is so much better in my deck than it is in theirs. Of course, they get to recur it with Renin Six, but getting a Shadow Spear on this board with a Pyrite Spell Bomb in play, it just feels like there should be... There should be more impactful one-mana artifacts that they could be getting, but I guess not. They decide to equip their Ragavan, which is going to allow them to get in with uh, the Ragavan and get a trigger off of it, but I decide to block and activate the hangar back anyway um, in the hopes of killing the Ragavan. I think they're gonna spell bomb it in response and I Welding Jar it in response, which allows me to resolve the Hanger Back trigger, but it does remove the Hanger Back from combat. Something often overlooked is that Regeneration removes creatures from combat, which is going to allow their Ragavan to survive and create treasures another day. They exile a land, and our Saga is going to... Um, come off of its third mode here. I decide to tab it for mana rather than making it construct because we've got three powerful cards in hand and uh, I think we have more powerful stuff to be doing this turn. I lead with an Ancient Stirrings and just take another land. Over the Walking Ballista. Man, talking like this is hard work. I'm going to have to start commentating less. All right, we get to resolve our Arcbound Ravager, which, like I said, is a really powerful thing to have. And now with two Sentinels in play, we're just going to be drawing a lot of cards. I decide to sack the Hanger back here to put counters on the Ozolith. I have the read that they don't have a removal spell, or they don't have two removal spells. They might have one, but I have the Welding Jar in play. So this way we get a 3 power Esper Sentinel, which um, is usually enough to outgrind a grindy deck, since we're just going to be drawing a card off of everything they play. I do decide to block the Ragavan here. I don't know if that was a misplay or not, but I decide to block and regenerate with Welding Jar. I should, I should assume that they have a removal here, but I guess the uh, combat actually goes through. And worst case scenario, the counters just end up on the Ozolith anyway. My opponent puts Luris in hand. This is the beginning of the end for them. I mean, we are really outstripping them on board, and they don't have anything better than Luris to play. Walking Ballista is the draw for turn. I cast it for X equals 1. That's going to be really good to put counters on if, um, 
if any of my creatures with counters get removed. Opponent gets a land, activates Hangerback Walker. I decide to sacrifice my own Hangerback in response. Sorry, I decide to sacrifice something in response. I don't know what, but um, I'm going to take this opportunity to put all of my counters on Arcbound Rat on uh, Walking Ballista, and. Um, Honestly, don't know if that was the right call, because I think we were so winning, but our opponent does have the bolt to get rid of the ballista. Now, though, we have a 3-3 uh, three, three Esper Sentinel and five counters on the Ozolith, so I'm counting on these Sentinels to get there. Uh, even though our opponent has Urza, I mean, uh, not Urza, Lurus in hand. So this game went from pretty winning to pretty losing pretty quickly. Um... I think sacking all of the artifacts to Ravager there was a bit of a misplay. And my opponent is complaining that um, the Esper Sentinel bug, which everybody should know about, stole their mana. See, they uh, there were two Esper Sentinels on the stack, so they tapped one mana for the one mana Esper Sentinel trigger. But the trigger on the stack was the three mana Esper Sentinel trigger. Since they did not have enough mana to pay for it, they had to let the uh, three mana trigger go unpaid. But that actually um, removed the one mana that they had floating for the one mana trigger from their mana pool, even though they hadn't paid for anything. And then they didn't have the mana to let me draw, uh, to stop me from drawing a card off of the one mana Sentinel. So this should be a lesson to everybody. If there's an Esper Sentinel trigger on the stack, do not float your mana. Uh, wait for the trigger to resolve and then tap your lands for mana if you intend to pay for it. Uh, the mana will show up on the side here and you can click yes to pay for it. Um, you can tap your lands as the trigger is resolving. You don't have to do it beforehand. And this also plays around uh, abilities that pump the Esper Sentinel's power uh, in between the triggering and the resolving of the Esper Sentinel. Something some people don't know is that if a 1 1 Esper Sentinel triggers off of a spell, <clears throat> but then you pump it up to, say, a 5 5, you have to pay 5 mana for that Esper Sentinel trigger if you want to stop your opponent from drawing a card. So there's no reason you should ever float mana before the trigger has actually resolved. And I use this trick with Pendlehaven or Arcbound Ravager or something to pump up the Esper Sentinel. I use that quite a bit over the course of this challenge. All right, so it's uh, a 5-5 five, five Hanger Backwalker versus what's about to be nine power worth of Esper Sentinels. Opponent has Lurus in play, which is pretty scary. We draw Welding Jar, play Ancient Stirrings, and put Lurus in hand. Uh, 10 power worth of Vesper Sentinels. And so I am going to get to draw a card here off of the 7-7 um, seven, seven Esper Sentinel, but my opponent is going to pay for the 3-3 three, three Esper Sentinel. We draw another Esper Sentinel. We get our Lurus down. Our opponent is going to Pyrite Spell Bomb it. Um... But at least we get a 2-2 Walking Ballista out of it. And Walking Ballista with the Ozolith in play um, is going to be pretty good. But actually, I just use the Ozolith to ping down my opponent's Lurus. <clears throat> They're going to use their Pyrite Spell Bomb to ping down my Lurus. And now we're back to where we started, except the Luruses are not on the board. So, three Esper Sentinels versus a steadily growing Hangerback Walker. And we are drawing bricks. Not a good sign. <clears throat> Opponent's hanger back walker now up to an 8-8, big enough to start attacking. We decide to double block here. Opponent does not have a removal spell, but they do get 7-1-1 flyers. We make a big hanger back walker, which if we can sacrifice it, might allow us to start blocking. 
but our opponent does have the lightning bolt for the win. So we lost game one of the challenge. <clears throat> against John Luris. We lost game one against um, John Saga. Now we're on to game two. So I'm going to be on the play. We both reveal Luris. Oh, pause. Didn't mean to click that. Okay, taking a pause here. Boy, I forgot how hard it can be to talk for this long. I tend to talk a lot when I get really get going and it really dries out my throat but um, I streamed for a little while and uh, after a while you get used to it but I haven't uh, haven't commentated like this in a long time. So let's uh, take a look at our sideboard plan here. I'm not a hundred percent sure that I sideboarded correctly every time especially against Judd and Saga, which is not really a matchup that I was prepared for. But this match, we decided to board out uh, all four Ancient Stirrings, three Welding Jars, one Arcbound Worker, and one Zabaz in exchange for the Pithing Needle, the three Prismatic Endings, um, the two Nature's Claims, and what looks like three more cards. What could those be? Let's see. Oh, I need an I need a list of my whole sideboard here. Hold on a sec. Right, so we decided to bring in the um, prismatic endings, the nature's claims, the pithing needle, the two relics of progenitus, and the shadow spear. We definitely overboarded a little bit here, um, but I'm not going to figure out what the correct sideboard plan is right now, and we definitely do fiddle around with the sideboard plan over the various games against Jun Saga this match. Um, so anyway, we decide to keep um, Razor Verge Thicket, Branch Loft Pathway, Pissing Needle, which we can use to name Engineered Explosives, an Arcbound Rite of Endure and a Walking Ballista, and two uh, removal spells on the play. Opponent opens up with turn one Thoughtseize, taking our Walking Ballista, and we respond with an Arc Arcbound Ravager. Now, we have nothing to sack to this Ravager and no way to protect it. And our opponent does just open right up with the Engineered Explosives on one, which is getting blanked by this Pithing Needle naming Engineered Explosives. Uh, but they decide to play it anyway. We have the removal spell <clears throat> for their uh, DRC here. And we also have the Nature's Claim, which I know I'm going to use on the Urza's Saga. So actually, it would have been correct here to claim in response to the Saga trigger so that they could not tap it for mana. As it is, they tap the uh, Saga to play a Tarmogoyf, and now they have one mana up. Um, we have the Prismatic Ending for our for our opponent's Tarmogoyf, so I'm not too worried about that here. Opponent gets in for six. We draw a hanger back walker for turn, and opponent does inquisition our prismatic ending. So that's maybe one reason that we should have exiled the Tarmogoyf, but um, I'm still not too worried. We get Luris in hand. We have a uh, hanger back that we can activate, and um, we do decide to activate and sack it to the Ravager as a bit of a mini chump block, we can replay it this turn using Luris. So, uh, Urza Saga, great draw for turn. Play the Saga, play the Luris, replay the Hangerback Walker. <clears throat> and now our board is looking pretty good. Our opponent is going to get to make a Construct and um, get a Pyrite Spellbomb to kill our Luris and get a Luris of their own. So we're not 100% winning here, but we've got a pretty good, a pretty decent board. We're about to get our Urza Saga resolved and maybe make a couple of constructs. And we're just hoping to draw some way to deal with our opponent's Luris. They do Pithing Needle 
Um, so in response, I'm going to activate all of my activated abilities, the Hangerback Walker, the Urza Saga, and the Arcbound Ravager, since I don't know what they're going to name with Piffing Needle. And um, then I'm going to use the Arcbound Ravager to put counters on Esper Sentinel so that our opponent will be unable to pay for this 4-4 Sentinel. And in fact, they're going to have a hard time casting non-creature spells with only four lands in play and a 4-4 Sentinel. They do get their Luris down, though, and they replay the Pyrite Spellbomb. So we get another Construct. And um, now we have Nature's Claim, which we can use on the Piffing Needle at instant speed if we ever do draw a Walking Ballista. And, of course, we're attacking with a 10-10 Trample Lifelink while our opponent's at 13. So it's not all bad. Um, we do decide to spend the Welding Jar to kill our opponent's Construct, but they cannot beat our 9-9 Trample Lifelink. Uh, on to Game 3 of Match 1. Alright, Game 3 on the draw against Jund Saga. Uh, oh, I was supposed to go over the opening hand here. So this is a great opening hand. We've got two Urza Sagas, which are always great against Jund Saga. Um, and a Hardened Scales, which is obviously great on its own. We don't have any creatures, but we do have two removal spells. So we should be able to grind pretty well here. <clears throat> and it doesn't look like I changed up the sideboard at all here. Oh, I did remove, I did take out another Arcbound Worker and another Zabaz um, in order to bring in the two Pad to Exiles as well. So actually we're trying out the full seven removal spells uh, in this sideboard plan in addition to the Relics of Progenitus and the Piffing Needle. Huge over sideboard here. Um, I honestly don't think the removal spells are that good against Jun Saga. But the Relics... Oh, and I don't think the... Um, Shadow Sphere is that good either, although it did win us that last game. I think maybe I wouldn't sideboard in the Shadow Sphere, just because you want more threats and less do-nothing cards against uh, against the grindy decks. Opponent seems to have a really slow draw here. They're just um, putting Luris in hand on turn 3, which is actually not going to do anything while I have a Relic in play. Um, I'm just playing my Saga starting to make some constructs, trying to keep some cards in hand and get maximum value out of my sagas to try and get ahead while our opponent is floundering. And I get Pithing Needle, naming Engineered Explosives, to keep these constructs alive. Opponent has Colgon's Command. And um, I do let the Relic die here. I think this was just a misclick. Opponent shocks my Construct and kills my Relic, and I was supposed to activate it to draw a card, but um, must have been a misclick. Opponent has Urza Saga, Renin 6, and uh, Nurturing Peat Land for their Renin 6. So this is uh, honestly not a great situation for us, but we do have six cards in hand and an Urza's Saga that's about to resolve, or it's um, about to start making constructs. I cast Hardened Scales, and I'm going to plan to make a construct here. Uh, Ren and Six gets back Nurturing Peatland. Our opponent is going to start making constructs with their Saga. Opponent spell bombs our construct. We make a construct. We get another relic of progenitus to try and shut down their Ren and Six grind plan. And I nature's claim the Urza Saga in response to the activation. Plus crack the relic so that they can't uh, can't replay Urza Saga with their Ren and Six. 
but they are going to get to keep playing Nurturing Peatland with their Renin 6. So I don't know if there was a way I could have done that, but Pithing Needle stopping Engineered Explosives for the second time this match. Remember to bring in Pithing Needle against uh, Jund and also Crixis Shadow for that very reason. Engineered Explosives can be a real blowout against us. Opponent decides to uh, chump block with their construct. Honestly, not sure about that. Um, since this Ravager would not have been lethal, uh, was I actually attacking the Renin 6? That makes sense. So they decide to keep the Renin 6 around and just um, sacrifice the construct token. Um, I path their uh, DRC in response to a Thought Seize so that Thought Seize doesn't get to take my path. But now our opponent basically has no way to stop what we've got going on here. Arcbound Ravager is a pretty good draw, and um, as the clock is ticking down, I'm feeling like this is a pretty good position for us. Opponent's on five cards in hand, but we do have Luris in hand, and we get a Hangerback activation here. Four or five Tarmogoyf, another Renin six. Looks like our opponent does not have a discard spell, so this Luris is going to get there, and we do... Um, Uh, we do sacrifice our Hanger Backwalker to make some Thopter tokens. This Arcbound Ravager is now uh, lethally big with two Hardened Scales in play and a Luris to get back Hanger Backwalker. And it looks like our opponent does not have a removal spell because in this position they concede. So that's 2 1 on match 1. Let's get into match 2, which it looks like we won 2 0. Oh going to drink some more water here. And you know what? I should probably make sure I'm still recording. Good. All right, round two. Uh, we won the die roll this time. And uh, we are up against a no companion deck. We decide to keep three sagas, two welding jars, a razor verge thicket, and a walking ballista. This is a really slow hand, but really grindy. So we're hoping our opponent is a slower opponent. And since they didn't reveal Luris, I think it's a pretty safe bet that they are. And it looks like we're up against Tron. So um, Ancient Stirring's the draw for the turn. Um, I'm going to Stirrings into an Arcbound Ravager, since we already have a Ballista. Um, get down an Urza's Saga, and start grinding. I would definitely have liked a faster hand against a Tron opponent, but with the draw of Hardened Scales, this hand is actually shaping up to be faster than I thought it was. Opponent does have turn 3 Tron, but Karn Liberated is actually not going to be good enough here, I don't think. Um, they, they decide to exile our walking ballista, which if they didn't, we would have just won on the spot with Ravager plus ballista. As it is, I ping the uh, Karn with the last ballista um, counter, just to make sure it can't minus next turn. Obviously, we are going to have to eat a Karn plus, but I do think I can win... Um, despite my opponent's Karn. I tap the Saga for mana and decide to get the Ozolith, which is going to be great with this Ravager, Zabaz, Hardened Scales combination here. Play another Saga, get down my whole hand, and now we're threatening lethal on our opponent in multiple ways here. So unless they have exactly Oblivion Stone, I don't think there's going to be anything they can do to stop it. Opponent has a 4-4 walking ballista. So this is a pretty interesting situation. Um, they can kill our Ravager or our Zabaz if we try and put counters on either of them, and they can also block. So I remember this was a pretty interesting puzzle. Um, see if you can figure it out in that situation before seeing the answer. I guess it's a little too late now, but what I ended up doing was getting Zabaz with the um, Urza's Saga, 
and having two Zabazes in play lets you get a modular trigger off of one of them with the legend rule. Opponent decides not to kill in response to the modular trigger, and obviously we have two uh, welding jars as well, so actually killing either one of these two with the walking ballista wouldn't be such a problem. Um, as soon as this Arcbound Ravager gets to be a 6-6, they can no longer kill it with Ballista. So by sacking the Welding Jar um, to grow the Arcbound Ravager, uh, I think... I, I, I think we'd still kill them if they were to Ballista the Ravager in response here, but they do not. So at this point, we have two lethal attackers, and it doesn't matter which one they block. They can't kill either of them, and I can use the Arcbound Ravager Sacrifice ability to put the counters on the other one. And our Tron opponent is at minus seven life. Game two against uh, Mono Green Tron on the draw. Uh, we decide to board out the Esper Sentinels. They're just too slow against Tron. We really want to just go um, as fast as possible and execute our plan A as fast as possible. The only thing we board in is the two copies of Nature's Claim, uh, one Pithing Needle, and one Shadow Spear, since uh, none of these cards are going to be <laughs> any good against Tron. Maybe you could board in the Prismatic Ending over the Shadow Spear, but I think the Shadow Spear is going to make us a little bit faster, and it's probably going to be better than Esper Sentinel if our opponent has, like, a Chump Blocker of some kind. We reveal Lurus. Oh, and we do take a Mulligan there. I, I have to stop clicking through the, um, the uh, opening hands because those are actually the most interesting part of the game. Anyway, um, I think we're going to keep this. The Boz, Ravager, Ozolith, and two Welding Jars is actually probably a turn three kill if our opponent has no interaction. Uh, we put back the extra Welding Jar, of course, and just start playing out our hand. Um, Tron opponent actually goes turn two Sanctum of Ugin. So at this point, they've lost the game. They have no chance of hitting turn three Tron. And we're just off to the races, so unless they have, like, a lot of Nature's Claims in hand, um, they're going to be too slow. Opponent taps a green mana for another Ancient Stirrings. They sack the Expedition map during Main Phase, which I honestly think is a bit of a spew here, because now we just have nothing to worry about. We're going all in um, on the kill here. Um... It looks like I did the math and I couldn't actually kill them with what I had on board, but I decided to put as many counters as possible on Hanger Backwalker so that if they do have something like, for example, Car and the Great Creator, we should be able to kill them anyways. So we have to do 16 damage here, um, and uh, once this Karn gets down, we won't be able to activate this Ravager that we have in hand. Uh, go ahead and think about it for a while, see if you can see the line. But I'm pretty sure I remember uh, actually combo killing our opponent here. So the line involves uh, sacrificing all but one Thopter token to the Arcbound Ravager and then putting all of the counters on that Thopter token. And as you can see, we actually have uh, exactly 16 damage in hand. So that's 2-0 against Tron and 2-0 in the challenge. Round three against Joker 10289. I believe I've played against Joker before. All right. Um, opening seven. Our opponent is on the play, and they take a mulligan. This hand has uh, three colorful cards and no colorful lands. So even though it's got a lot of power here, I think this is going to be a mulligan. And it looks like I do mulligan that one. This hand has an Urza Saga, but not a lot of power. We are on a Molta 6, so I think I'm going to keep it here. And that is what I end up doing. 
putting back the ink moth nexus so that uh, at least we have a decent um, we have a decent lineup here. Opponent opens with Island Mishra's Bobble. This is a sure sign of blue red Murktide, uh, and also no companion, which I think is generally a pretty good matchup for us. Um, Welding Jar for the draw. That's going to combo really well with our Esper Sentinel. And Esper Sentinel, obviously, really good against Blue Red Murktide because they rely so heavily on their spells. Uh, we're going to play an Ozolith here to just kill our opponent's Ragavan. And um, the theme of this game is just going to be to keep this Esper Sentinel alive as long as possible. Our opponent casts Expressive Inter Iteration on turn 3 without playing a third land. And uh, drawing cards off this Esper Sentinel just feels so good. There's no way, there's no way our Murktide opponent is going to be able to come back from this. They do play a 5-5 five five Murktide Regent. Um, but we are making some 5-5 five five Constructs. We have an Ozolith in play. Now it's a 6-6 six six Construct. Opponent can't block it. We Alpha Strike. Uh, opponent lets us draw off that Lightning Bolt, which uh, is pretty surprising, honestly. They do have Petty Theft to trade off. Oh, to actually keep the Murktide alive. But we have Walking Ballista, uh, which we can use to get the last counter off that Murktide. Opponent has Blood Moon. Uh, Blood Moon is not going to save them. It is going to turn off this Ancient Stirrings. Um, and we, ha we do um, have trouble tapping our mana here. Uh, the internet at the house that I was staying at when I played this challenge was really shoddy. And that did end up coming into play at times but um it looks like we were pretty good on time uh at the time that that happened so we didn't throw away too much time um having to retap our mana and it looks like our opponent is not drawing well enough um to outgrind what we've got in play because they concede this is uh game two of round three against uh, Merc Tide. Uh, we decided to board out the Ancient Stirrings um, and the Welding Jars, which honestly I think is a bit of a mistake um, since Saga or, or since uh, Esper Sentinel plus Welding Jar is just so good against our opponent's deck. But Path to Exiles and um, Prismatic Endings are also pretty decent at just dealing with what they have in play. Um, because being able to prismatic ending your opponent's uh, DRC can really slow them down, and obviously Path is good against Murktide Regent. We boarded out one Urza Saga here. I do this quite a bit in the challenge, and honestly, I'm not sure if boarding out Urza Saga is ever correct, even if you expect your opponent to have a lot of um, Alpine Moons. But... Um, Especially since we're boarding in uh, Prismatic Endings here, which can deal with Alpine Moon, I think you probably shouldn't board out Urza's Saga. Like I said at the beginning, the build that I'm playing here is basically pre-boarded for the grindy matchups. So uh, over-sideboarding in these matchups is going to be uh, a bad habit of mine that we'll see come up again and again. Alright, opening 7. Uh, we've got Hardened Scales, Hangerback Walker, Ozolith, and Zabaz. I think this is a great hand. It's got all the mana it needs. And Hardened Scales into Hangerback Walker can be very difficult for Blue Red Murktide to beat. Opponent opens up with a DRC. They do have Engineered Explosives on one, <clears throat> which is going to be really good against this hand. As you can see, it has three one drops. We did bring in the, we did remember to bring in the Pithing Needle for this Engineered Explosives, but we basically have no choice here but to play the Hangerback Walker, which our opponent has Archmage's Charm for. 
So now with our opponent having stolen our only good zero drop and having an engineered explosive for all of our one drops, we're forced to just put Luris in hand and kind of wait for our opponent to kill us. I'm really hoping to draw another hangar back walker here or something. But no, we're just going to keep drawing one drops. I cycle the um, Relic of Progenitus, and I do draw Prismatic Ending, which I can use to deal with my opponent's um, Engineered Explosives. But they still have this Hangerback Walker in play, which is getting bigger and bigger. Opponent has Force of Negation for my Relic of Progenitus. I get down a 3-3 Zavaz, which is going to be pretty good with the Hardened Scales and the Ozolith, but opponent has another EE. And at that point, there's not going to be much that I can do. They even have Unholy Heat to kill the uh, Inkmoth Nexus in response to the Zavaz activation. So I'm not going to be able to keep any of these counters. And then they crack the Engineered Explosives, wiping my board. So even though I have Luris in hand, I'm at 6 life and I'm not going to be able to race my opponent's Hangerback Walker. I block with my own Hangerback Walker to create some 1 1 tokens to chump block, but our opponent has a big Murktide region, and uh, now we have to chump block a lot. We don't even have the mana to cast Luris, and this game is just unwinnable. So we're on to game 3. <clears throat> It looks like I did decide not to keep the Prismatic Endings in, and I did bring that 4th Urza Saga back in instead of the Prismatic Endings. So uh, I definitely like this sideboard plan a little bit better against Blue Red Mark Tide. I also brought in oh, an extra Welding Jar to try and keep those Sentinels alive. This is an opening hand that has an Esper Sentinel, and it has an Urza Saga, and it has, oh, it's got Sentinel and Welding Jar, so like I said, this is a great, great plan against um, Blue Red Murktide, especially on the play. Opponent mulligans to six, and I really don't see them being able to beat this. They do uh, pay for the Esper Sentinel on their first turn. Uh, but honestly, it just feels so good for our opponent to be spending their entire turn playing a Mishra's Bobble, right? They're basically accomplishing nothing. Here we, um, we do pump the Esper Sentinel in response to uh, our opponent floating mana here, and they are not going to have anything to do with that extra mana once they let the Esper Sentinel go unpaid. And this is one of the reasons why Pendlehaven is such a good utility land in these Esper Sentinel builds. That was an entirely wasted mana for our opponent. Um, we don't want to play these one drops just yet because of our opponent's engineered explosives, but we can get Pipping Needle if this Urza, Urza's Saga ever does its thing. We crack the Welding Jar to keep the uh, Sentinel in play, and we crack the uh, Relic to draw a card. Opponent has Unholy Heat, but that's going to trigger Esper Sentinel again, and we have another one in hand. At this point, with uh, Ancient Stirrings, Sentinel, and Arcbound Ravager, we could just make a really big Esper Sentinel, but instead I decide to grow my Hangerback Walker. Tapping Hangerback Walker in your main phase is actually generally pretty good to do. Uh, it might play into Archmage's Charm here, which is one downside. But um, this way, your opponent can't kill the hanger back in response to the activation, and this guarantees that you're going to get those counters on it. Opponent does not have Archmage's Charm. All they have is an, an expressive iteration. Um, and we do get the Ozolith with our Urza's Saga, and this should be a combo kill with Arcbound Ravager and Ink Moth Nexus and the Ozolith. So that was match three against Blue Red Murktide. Ah. Yeah, I really gotta warm up my voice if I'm gonna make any more content. Talking like this is just ruining my throat. <clears throat> but I'm having fun, so on we go. Round four against Chase 
and then some binary. Uh, looks like I am going to be on the play for round four. Opponent reveals Luris. I think you have to assume it's going to be Grixis Shadow since that's the most played Luris deck. Or actually, Hammer Time is the most played Luris deck, but Grixis Shadow is the Luris deck that we fear most. This hand can cast Esper Sentinel, um, and it's got a nice curve with some powerful cards in it and two Urza Sagas. I love it. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong button here. Why does it keep moving around? Anyway, with uh, Blood Crypt into Ragavan, I am pretty sure we're up against Grixis Shadow here. I'm going to go Saga into Hangerback Walker. Opponent has Seal of Fire to kill the Esper Sentinel. And we are just going to block with this Hangerback Walker here. Getting hit with Ragavan is usually not that bad, but... Um, being able to kill it and make a Thopter token is just pretty good value, so I'm going to keep it. And I do have another Hanger Backwalker as follow-up. And it turns out our opponent is not on Grixis Shadow. They're on Domain Zoo with Territorial Kavu. This is a deck I've only played against once before, but I did win last time I played against it. Um, and... As you saw earlier, the result is not going to be any different here. So we get an Ozolith off of our Urza Saga. We make a big Construct token and um, play our other Urza Saga to activate. Hanger Back Walker. Opponent does have Tribal Flames, killing our 5-5 Construct token. And a Wild Nakatl. But honestly, their aggro plan just feels so underpowered com compared to how big our creatures can get when we start activating them. I put a counter on the Hangerback Walker. <clears throat> I have Arcbound Ravager and Ballista and the Ozolith here. Um, and I guess I did the math and I realized I could just um, put all my power on this Thopter token and kill our opponent who's at 12 life. <clears throat> Game two against Domain Zoo. We board in uh, all of our removal spells, including the Nature's Claims, um, which are useful against some. Oh, uh, against uh, um, Scion of Draco. Scion of Draco is a two mana, four, four flying with powerful abilities, and it's an artifact creature in the Domain Zoo deck. So that's the only thing I think that uh, Nature's Claim is good against besides like Alpine Moon. We do board out all of the Esper Sentinels and all of the Ancient Stirrings for those removal spells. Opponent is going to be on the play, but it's not going to end up mattering. They open up with a 1-1 Wild Nakatl. And I honestly just can't help but laugh I'm sure Domain Zoo is good against some things, just not Hardened Scales. With uh, the Ozolith and a Hardened Scales in play, it's kind of hard to imagine losing this game. We get down our Zabaz and our Walking Ballista. Actually, no, we don't. We just decide to make a Construct token. That's good too, I guess. They kill it with Seal of Fire. And they do play a 7-7... Scourge of the Skyclaves. I'm I haven't totally won here, but I do have Zabaz, um, which I can use with the other Zabaz to trigger modular, and I do have enough mana here to activate the Zabaz, and that's going to put a lethal amount of counters on this Walking Ballista. In combination with the Ozolith, um. You know, I should, I, should, I should pause whenever, you know, there's a line like this so that you can figure it out for yourself. But um, it might be fun to just take screenshots of these uh, interesting combo kill moments and uh, make puzzles out of them. Maybe I'll do that at some point. So that was round four against Domain Zoo.
uh, round five. Uh, we decide to keep this. We are up against Luris, and this hand has Esper Sentinel and Welding Jar, which, as we know, is really good against Grixis Shadow. We also have some other powerful cards like Ozlith, Ancient Stirrings, and Urza's Saga. This is an easy keep, even though it only has one of those super powerful cards. Well, it's got Ozolith too. Ozolith is like an honorary member of the core of the deck club, right? You only play two of them, and you kind of prefer to tutor for them with Urza's Saga. But when it works, it works so well that uh, you, you can count it as power. The power four of, uh, of Hardened Scales. Ozolith, Saga, Arcbound Ravager, and Hardened Scales itself. Speaking of which, we draw the Arcbound Ravager. Uh, remember to play your Welding Jar before your Esper Sentinel in case your opponent has Force of Vigor. And it looks like we are up against Grixis Shadow again. We do regenerate the Esper Sentinel draw a card. Opponent has Fatal Push, but we still got a 3 for 2 there. And our opponent is pretty low on cards in hand. We're just going to get down the Ozolith and then Arcbound Worker here. Opponent has another Expressive Iteration, but it looks like they don't have a third land, and this is not looking very good for them. Um, since our hand is so powerful, I'm not going to bother making a Construct I'm just going to cast the Ancient Stirrings and the Arcbound Ravager, finding a Walking Ballista, and I think we are set up for the kill next turn, especially if our opponent keeps doing damage to their own life total. They do have Colagon's Command here, uh, which is going to wipe our board, but before it does, I'm going to um, activate the Arcbound Ravager, and this results in uh, one or two extra counters getting put on the Ozolith after the resolution. And with the ability to get Zabaz off of Urza's Saga, I think the combination of Arcbound Ravager and the Ozolith here is going to actually be the kill. Yep, there it is. It just, it just feels so good when your opponent's like, I just wiped your board, and now you've got a lethal Walking Ballista in play. This deck is, this deck is actually insane. Like, like... <laughs> our opponent wiped our board except for an Ozolith with four counters on it, and then we just won the game with with no creatures in play from from zero to sixty, from zero to dead. Oh yeah, let's check out the sideboard plan here. So for this one, I boarded out the Ancient Stirrings and one Urza Saga, and I decided to bring in. I didn't even remember to bring in the Pithing Needle. So, yeah, definitely supposed to bring in Pithing Needle against uh, Grixis Shadow just for the Engineered Explosives. Um, and I think boarding out the Stirrings is probably correct. Um, or maybe just one Stirrings for a Pithing Needle or one Arcbound Worker for a Pithing Needle. But honestly, like, I'm not sure if... Um, Prismatic Ending is even worth it against Grixis Shadow. It does exile stuff, which makes it hard to replay with Luris. Um, opponent opens up with an Inquisition. Uh, and this hand has a Hangerback Walker. Oh, did I? Wait, wait, wait. Stop. Stop. Okay, I must have spammed the next turn button. So you got to see that hand, that whole game flash by real quick there. Did we actually kill our opponent's... Luris? I guess, okay, so they put Luris in hand. Um, we got, they they also inquisitioned our Ozolith, but now we have a Hangerback Walker with a Hardened Scales in play and two Arcbound Ravagers and two Welding Jars. Um, and our opponent's at 10 life. Do we just have the kill on board? I think we just have the kill on board right here, right now. Um, but instead I decide to activate Hangerback Walker and play an Arcbound Ravager. This, uh, this does play around removal. A little bit better I think um, but in response to a removal spell we are gonna make a few Thopter tokens and with our opponent at eight life and two Arcbound Ravagers in play um, there's not gonna be much they can do with these two welding jars we'll have no trouble saving our Thopters from removal 
they do have Colgon's command, um, which is going to kill uh, a Thopter in response to a lethal Earthbound Ravager activation. But we actually have enough artifacts in play just to ignore this and put all our counters on the other Thopter for the kill. Eight life is not a lot when you're facing down Arcbound Ravager and Hardened Scales. So that was a 2-0 match against Grixis Shadow. Uh, I think I'm going to stop there. I'll do rounds 6 through 11 tomorrow. Um, I hope you enjoyed. This deck is super fun to play, and I really hope more people end up picking it up and doing well with it in tournaments. I wouldn't even mind if people started playing more Artifact Hate in their sideboards. I mean, this deck is so underplayed that um, I honestly could see a future in which um, in which this was a significant part of the, met of the meta and people had to start playing more Force of Vigors to combat it. Um, but uh, remember to like and subscribe, and if this video gets 100 likes, then I will record some live gameplay with live commentary. And I'll see you for part two.